Well, um, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thank you very much for tuning in to this, uh, the fourth, I think, of the IFS's contributions to the SRC Festival of Social Science just so far this week. Today, we're talking about uh, equal opportunities and intergenerational mobility. And I'm delighted to uh, welcome first Lindsay McMillan of the Centre for Educational Policy and Equalising Opportunities at UCL, and uh, also a research fellow at the Institute for Fiscal Studies, who's going to present uh, some of the work she's been doing with colleagues here at the IFS, looking at uh, intergenerational mobility and social mobility across uh, England and in different parts, different geographical uh, areas. Um, she's going to speak for about uh, 12 to 15 minutes, and then we've got three um, uh, respondents who will offer their own uh, reflections on social mobility from their point of view. Uh, the first will be Lee Elliott Major, who uh, is um, the country's, I think, first professor of social mobility, who is a base at the University of Exeter and has written extensively uh, on this topic. Uh, we'll then have Anne-Marie Canning, who's chief executive of the Brilliant Club, which works with uh, schools uh, and universities to promote uh, social uh, mobility and finally Liz Williams um, of future.now and uh, from for our point of view particularly uh, one of the social uh, mobility uh, commissioners who will be giving their perspective on this there'll then be plenty of time hopefully about half an hour uh, for questions you should all have access to the uh, Slido link so if you have any questions um, as our speakers are speaking or at the end please put them uh, into Slido uh, and as ever you can vote for other people's questions if you particularly want them answered to make them look uh, particularly popular. Uh, we're going to go straight through the speakers, I'm not going to interrupt again until they've all uh, finished, uh, so I will stop there and hand over directly to Lindsay, thank you. And thanks very much Paul. Um, and as, as you said, I'm going to be talking through a recent report that we've written for the Social Mobility Commission, uh, The Long Shadow of Deprivation, Differences in Opportunities Across England. And as Paul mentioned, this is joint work with colleagues at IFS, Pedro Canero, Sarah Catton, Lorraine Dearden, Laura van der Erb and Sonia Krutikova. So in this report, we take a detailed look at social mobility in England and more specifically, how equal opportunities are for people from different backgrounds and different places. We make two main contributions here. First, we show how opportunities vary by place. Second, we show why there are differences in opportunities across places in England. And specifically, we're asking, is this all about education or do we need to look beyond that? Now we're able to do this thanks to new administrative data linkages, the Longitudinal Education Outcomes or LEO data. This innovative new data links school records for children to university records and for the first time through into the labour market using tax records. And this new data allows us to follow 820,000 state educated sons from their schooling including their family circumstances at age 16, and crucially, where they were living, through into the labour market to observe their earnings at age 28 for the first time. Note that we are focusing only on sons here. While this is a source of frustration for all of us, unfortunately, it's the best we can do, given that we only observe annual earnings in our data and not hours of work. This is particularly problematic for daughters since fertility patterns and hence part-time work varies by family childhood circumstance. Now there are four main findings that I want to talk through today. First, using two different metrics of mobility, we show that where you grow up in England does matter for life chances. Second, even when you compare sons with the same qualifications, we find very similar patterns of mobility across England. And what this is telling us is that in the, air, in the least mobile areas, family background persists beyond educational qualifications. And I'll explain this in more detail in just a moment. The third point to make is that education is still a crucial part of the story. This accounts for an average around 80% of the pay gap across local authorities. 
but it does not explain differences between areas. Again, I'll explain that more in a second. And finally, in order to level up, we need to take a place-based place -based combined approach, joining up education policy and labour market interventions that seek to equalise opportunities across places. So just to start with the first finding, where you grow up matters, and we show this using two different metrics. The first looks at adult earnings of disadvantaged sons across local authorities in England. Now the map on the left here shows the dark shaded regions with the lowest pay for sons who grew up in disadvantaged families and light shaded regions with the highest pay for sons who grew up in disadvantaged families. In areas with the highest pay for sons from disadvantaged families, earnings are twice as high as in areas with the lowest pay for sons from disadvantaged families. And note that this isn't a north-south divide story. There are dark and light areas spread throughout the country. Our second metric, when considering mobility across England, looks at the pay gap in adult earnings of sons from the most and least advantaged families from the same area when growing up. Dark areas here are the least mobile areas, so they have the largest pay gaps, the largest difference in adult earnings between sons from disadvantaged and sons from advantaged homes from the same place. While the light areas are the most mobile, they have the smallest pay gaps between these sons from different backgrounds from the same place. In the least mobile areas, pay gaps are two and a half times larger than in areas that are the most mobile. And again, this is spread throughout the country with darker and lighter areas right next to each other across many of the broader regions. To pull out a couple of examples, we have Manchester here, which is one of the most mobile areas, right next to Oldham, which is one of the least mobile areas in the country. And down south, we have Chichester, which is one of the most mobile areas, right next to Worthing, which is one of the least mobile areas. So why do such differences exist across local authorities in England? Well, people might expect this just to be a story about education, for this to be driven by differences in the educational performance of sons from different backgrounds at school. But we find that's not the case here. If we compare pay gaps across local authorities between sons from advantaged and disadvantaged homes from the same place, but also crucially with the same qualifications, we find a strikingly similar pattern across England. So what is this telling us? Well, if you take the example on the screen of two hypothetical pairs of sons, at the top, we have Dave and Don, who grew up in a highly mobile area. Dave is from a disadvantaged family and Don is from a more advantaged background. They go to school, they get the same qualifications and they enter into the labour market. In this example, they end up earning a similar amount. The education that they achieve at school means that they end up in the labour market earning similar earnings. While at the bottom, we have Jim and John. Jim and John grew up in a low mobility area. Again, they go to school, they get the same qualifications and they enter into the labour market. Only this time, John still earns more than Jim. Jim's family background casts a long shadow, meaning that he still earns less than John as an adult, despite having the same achievement at school. In low mobility areas, education does not equalise opportunities like it does in high mobility areas. Here's another way to illustrate this point. Here we're showing pay gaps between advantaged and disadvantaged sons for each of our 320 local authorities across England. And we're just pulling out some examples of the names on the axis here. On the left hand side, we have the most mobile areas with the smallest pay gaps. And on the right hand side, we have the least mobile areas with the largest pay gaps. The dark part of the bars, the shaded part, is the pay gap in each place that can be accounted for by differences in education qualifications that sons from different backgrounds achieve. So across the country, sons from more disadvantaged backgrounds do typically achieve lower educational qualifications than sons from more advantaged backgrounds. 
what the light part of the bar is showing us is that pay gap that exists for sons that have the same educational qualifications from different backgrounds. So note that while education accounts for a large part of the pay gap everywhere, on average around 80% across all local authorities, its contribution across local authorities is actually broadly stable. The main difference across local authorities is actually the light part of the bars, the pay gap that is persisting beyond education. In the most mobile areas, the entire pay gap is driven by differences in educational qualifications between sons from more advantaged and more disadvantaged families. In the least mobile areas, even if they achieve the same qualifications, sons from poorer backgrounds still face a penalty in the labour market. So what is this telling us? Well, in order to level up, education policy alone is not enough. The importance of reducing educational inequality was clear to see. A large chunk of the pay gap everywhere could be reduced if we tackle this. But in order to reduce differences across places, we also need to look beyond this to understand barriers in the labour market. We've shown wide disparities in terms of both the adult earnings of sons from disadvantaged families, but also in terms of how they fare relative to sons from more affluent families from the same place. When we combine our metrics, as we do here, to look at places above and below the national average, we find a particular group of areas that do badly on both of our metrics. These areas have notably lower opportunities, both in terms of education. For example, they only have on average 18% outstanding schools in these areas compared to 26 to 28% in all other areas but also in terms of labour market opportunities. So again, for example, they have only 21% of people working in professional or managerial jobs in these areas, compared to 29% in other areas. Finally, looking at the current policy landscape, there are a couple of notable interventions that look promising. They've got a lot of overlap with our low mobility areas using our metrics although there are some notable exceptions that we draw out in the report. Now, Anne-Marie is gonna talk a little bit more about opportunity areas in just a moment. I think more generally, what our findings are suggesting is that we need to take a place-based approach and encourage interventions that look beyond education policy. So linking schools and colleges to local employers in the labor market. And I need to end just with the slightly depressing point about what is likely to come next. Given the scale of the economic crisis that we're currently facing, we really should take a moment to recognize that this snapshot of time that we've presented here could worsen in the coming years. If the COVID recession reinforces the importance of childhood family circumstances, as it was seen to do in previous recessions, then it could be the case that these inequalities and opportunities might widen in years to come. I'll now hand over to Professor Lee Elliott Major, who's going to talk a bit more about recent evidence relating to the pandemic and social mobility. Thank you very much, Lindsay. That was brilliant. Um, brilliantly presented um, complex data. Um, I, I think the first thing I wanted to say was um, I'm so excited to see this study because we finally got our answer to Chetty in the US. We've been looking at the regional and local dis differences in income mobility in the US. So it's amazing to have this uh, stark and as you say, quite depressing map in some, in some ways. I, I think it does for me signal a number of changes uh, in, in the policy debate on this. Um, and I think first is, is that we're moving from national uh, policies to regional and local policy, and I think that's a really uh, good uh, direction. I also think it speaks to the issue of addressing the wider issues of social mobility, so it's not just about plucking a few individuals from different places around the country 
and transporting or catapulting them into urban centres like London and Manchester. It's about also how we regenerate those communities uh, so everyone has a decent uh, uh, stand of life and, and work. Um, so, so I, I think this really opens up new, new, new avenues in the policy debates, um, and I totally agree. As you know, um, I've been arguing for, for some time now that if we are serious about uh, addressing social mobility, we need to address both inequalities outside the school gates as well as inside. So some of the things I'm going to propose really uh, relate to both those things. Um, but to depress you even more on, on all this, for those who, who didn't um, see the BBC Panorama programme a few, few weeks ago, uh, and this comes from uh, an ESRC uh, funded project with colleagues at LSE, uh, we've been looking at some of the emerging uh, inequalities uh, during um, the COVID pandemic, and this builds on lots of other work by IFS and others. Um, we did a survey uh, in October and, and, and analysed data from April as well. So this is kind of quite live uh, data. And I guess some just headlines, what we're finding is that those from the most privileged backgrounds seem to be the only ones that are insulating themselves from uh, this crisis, educationally speaking. So they tend to be the ones. So, so private schools, for example, those are private schools are sort of almost twice as likely to have had a full school day during those early partial school closures. But there's also about a quarter of children that had nothing during that, that time. Uh, so I think there's issues at the very top and bottom that I, I think we, we, need, we need to uh, worry about for different, different reasons. We also know that young people uh, from this research uh, were twice as likely uh, to have lost a job uh, under 25s compared to over 25s. The reason those um, facts and figures are troubling is, as you all know, two of the main drivers of future social mobility are income or, or inequalities in the workplace and uh, inequalities in education. If you've got two of those things pointing in the wrong direction, it probably means that the future maps of uh, regional social mobility will look even uh, more stark. Um, and, and we've got some initial regional data, but it's, it's a very broad regional uh, basis. Um, and at the moment, it looks like, for example, uh, those in the L London and South East area had more schooling uh, uh, than those in, in the Midlands and, and North. But as Lindsay was saying, that the problem with those is their averages, and I suspect there'll be lots of variation uh, uh, within that. So what would I sort of suggest uh, in terms of policy responses to this, this, this report? Um, some of this comes from my book, which, uh, which is uh, available uh, now on Amazon and elsewhere. Uh, and, and in the book, we, we, we identify and suggest a number of, of reforms. And I want, I guess I want to think big here. So I'm sort of um, uh, invoking the sort of new, new deal rhetoric of President Roosevelt after the Great Depression um, nearly a century ago. And I think we need to think uh, about similar radical reforms. Uh, the first thing I would uh, suggest we consider are job guarantees. So that uh, particularly for the young, actually, those that are facing long-term unemployment, we all know about the the real um, uh, penalty, the scarring that is caused by long-term unemployment, I would look at creating things like some suggested national youth corps where you pay at least the minimum salary for young people, but perhaps not just young people, for all people to do jobs that also contribute to society, maybe the environment uh, or, or education. In the book, we also suggest a national social mobility service, and this would try and tap into the sort of volunteering spirit I believe we're seeing more of uh, in, in younger generations to maybe do tutoring. Uh, we've already got the national tutoring program, of course, but this would this would be much bigger than that, um, and maybe doing sort of mentoring programs to, to help other disadvantaged uh, young people. So, so I th I think we need to look at. Uh, guaranteed jobs uh, and training uh, um, to, to address some of the stark inequalities in the workplace that we're seeing uh, during the, uh, the, the pandemic. The second proposal I, I would suggest is, is trying to incentivize uh, high performing or high quality teachers to the areas that need them most. Um, the, the study uh, that, that you, you presented, of course, showed that both education inequality and uh, employment or work employment are, are, are important. And one of the real um, challenges we've had in education policies, how do you 
uh, incentivize teachers to get to those areas that need them the most. I think we could look at, at models of this. There, there's models in other countries where you might get higher pay or it might be part of your uh, career trajectory. Um, I, I think we need to get careful. I'm just conscious of giving talks to teachers how exhausted teachers are at the moment. But I do think that is the key key issue within schools because we know teachers are the biggest factor, teaching quality is the biggest factor within schools. Um, I would also argue we might want to look at regional weighting of pupil premium to perhaps pay for that, for some of that. And then finally, I know Anne-Marie is going to talk a little bit more about this, um, uh, but, but I would suggest um, that we pilot more uh, children's zones uh, in, in this country. Um, now, there are, there are many uh, that are all already being trialled, but the, the thing that I like about children's zones, and these, when I talk about uh, children's zones or, or hubs, I'm talking about those that are focused around schools. So these are wraparound services where uh, you, you, you have a school, but you also uh, offer, uh, well, meals, actually, a very topical uh, debate in the UK at the moment, uh, meals, but also so medical and, and, and other services. So they're almost, and many schools are doing this already, by the way, acting like social welfare hubs as much, much as centers of learning. Um, I think the, the, the bottom line with this though, is the, the evaluations in, in things like the Harlem Zone shows that you need to pay for this. So about twice as amount, amount of money per pupil is needed uh, if, if, you, if you look at the Harlem uh, model. So I know there's, there's already innovative practice happening across the country, but I, I guess my, my plea would be let's do some more research and evaluation over those models uh, to see if they can work in different parts of the country, both uh, rural, coastal, but also urban contexts. Uh, so I'll finish there because my seven minutes is up, uh, but my, 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 my overall sort of feeling is despite the grim findings that Lindsay and I have presented, uh, this is a real opportunity for us to think big uh, and, and, and address these, these stark inequalities. Over to you, Anne-Marie. Thank you very much, Lee. Um, hopefully I will provide a dose, a dose of realistic optimism. Um, my name's Anne-Marie Canning and, and yes, I'm the CEO of the Brilliant Club, that's my day job, but I also hold a public appointment as the independent chair of the Bradford Opportunity Area. And what I thought I'd do with my time is tell you a little bit about the Opportunity Areas, a little bit about beautiful Bradford, and then why I think paying attention to place is so critical for building better uh, life chances for children. So the Opportunities are a DfE funded initiative. They've been around since 2016. They're the 12 areas of the country that have the lowest levels uh, of social mobility uh, for children that grow up there. Uh, that was measured by the Social Mobility Index. That was a report produced by the Social Mobility Commission. 16 pieces of data brought together to build a picture of how likely it is for a child to get a decent education and critically a decent job as well. And so the opportunity areas were born out of that. There are 12 of them, as I said, uh, some of them are, you know, places you might not expect to be opportunity areas. We have Blackpool, Doncaster, where I'm from, Hastings, uh, but also some, some less obvious areas, for example, Cambridge, East Cambridge, Sir, East Cambridgeshire and the Fenlands. Those 12 areas had a shared pot of money, £72 million, and three years to try and change some of the patternings we saw in life chances for children. They've been extended for a fourth year and are playing a critical role in COVID recovery. And at the heart of each opportunity area is the partnership board. The partnership board brings together all the relevant local actors who could help to improve children's life chances. On my board, I have the chief, chief exec of the local council, the regional schools commissioner, a range of head teachers, and critically, lots of business uh, leaders from the local area too. And each opportunity area has a, has a context specific local plan. We have a delivery plan that is publicly available and that we're held to account on. So let me tell you a little bit about Bradford. Bradford is the most wonderful city in the UK, in my opinion. Uh, it's an amazing place. Uh, it's a place uh, that is huge and a very young city as well. Of all the children in the 12 opportunity areas, a quarter of them live in my opportunity area in Bradford. Bradford is the place that invented free school meals in 1906. And right now it's a city where 20,000 children uh, are educated in schools that are inadequate or require improvement as rated by Ofsted. 
Now, we knew in Bradford that if we only took an education view of this, uh, this challenge, then we would fall short. And so we've always had a broader, wider view of how different systems interact uh, to create life chances for children. In Bradford, we're very lucky to have the largest longitudinal cohort study in Europe. It's called Born in Bradford, and it's absolutely incredible. It has 14,000 children across the city signed up to it. Through that initiative, we've been able to bring together health and education data, and we were able to find hundreds of children who can't read, not because they're illiterate, but because they don't have the right glasses on their faces. Whilst Lindsay's report calls for a bringing together of both education and labour market initiatives, I'd like to add health into the mix as well. It's impossible to learn well if you don't get a healthy start in life. So we're working across systems in Bradford and it's complex and it's tough and it's really quite gnarly, but we have to do it because that's what we ask children and families to do every day of their lives. It can feel daunting, but it's completely necessary to bring these systems together to build a proper picture of what it means to be a child in the city of Bradford. Another uh, focus for us, for example, has been uh, bringing uh, careers education into greater prominence in the city. It's wonderful to have great careers education, but actually it's very difficult uh, if there are no meaningful labour market opportunities that match up to that career education uh, locally. And that's why we've worked very hard with colleagues on our partnership board, including PricewaterhouseCoopers, to relocate some of their offices from Leeds into Bradford so that there are meaningful uh, labour market opportunities for young people locally. It means that we have a joined up approach with the local authority on their inc inclusive local growth plan as well. That joined up approach is so critical. And if the opportunity areas have done one thing, it's that it has brought people together around a common framework and has brought together people to act uh, in tandem so that we can create a better future for children. We see ourselves in Bradford as building an ecosystem of opportunity and education is one part of that. But actually, I've spent my career opening up educational opportunity and it's more obvious than ever before that we have to take a wider view. Now, there are lots of examples of this wider view, both in an international context and closer to home. If you take something like the Harlem Children's Zone, it's been running since 1970 and has incredible results in helping children to be college ready uh, and helping them to get brilliant life outcomes all the way through from cradle to college. We have other examples of children's zones closer to home. For example, the amazing children's hub at Reach Academy, Felton, or you might want to look at the Save the Children uh, 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 community zones in places like the Pembury Estate in Hackney. There are lots of uh, examples of how you can bring people uh, to create better futures for children, to have a common plan about what it will take to help kids get a better start in life. So for me, it's really quite clear. We should be focused on building pipelines of activities for children from cradle to college or womb to workplace we need a joined up approach across a range of systems so that we can get every single incremental gain possible for children in the UK today. This is not just a, a beautiful idea. This is rooted very clearly in academic research, particularly the work of Raj Shetty at Harvard University, which Lee uh, mentioned earlier on. You only have to look at the results from some of these children's zones to realize that it makes perfect sense to take an, a holistic view of what it means to be a child in one of these places. The reality is, is that social mobility is a contact sport and it will be won city by city, town by town, village by village. And so what I'd like to see in the UK today in response to reports like Lindsay's is a real focus on how we bring people into common alliance to create a better future for our kids. I'll hand over now to Liz. Thanks very much, Anne-Marie. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to join you today. Um, I'm Liz Williams, one of the government's social mobility commissioners, the organisation behind the research Lindy has shared. Um, as a commission, we wanted to understand more about the impact of place, how where you live affects your life prospects. And as we've heard this afternoon, it's incredibly important. The Long Shadow Report shows us that education is crucial for social mobility, but on its own, it's not enough. It must be aligned with the labour market and skills if we are to level up. 
and ensure that achieving qualifications translates into good life outcomes. That's the key finding of the Long Shadow Report and, and my congratulations to Lindsay on bringing it alive for us all this afternoon. But Long Shadow is one of a number of research reports that, that we published at the Commission and I wanted to bring another to your attention this afternoon. It's called Moving Out to Move On. It's on our website. Unfortunately, um, we have a rather long URL, but if you put Social Mobility Commission into your search engine, you'll find us. Um, this report found that people often need to leave home to be socially mobile. Just think about that. It can be incredibly hard to leave home and not everybody wants to. They may prefer not to uproot, but to stay close to family and friends and community. That to me is an unacceptable truth and together, those reports pace a, a, a kind of reality of, of what, what's going on with social mobility, what, what people need. It's a sad fact today that where you live has significant impact on your life chances. Um, I often talk about talent being everywhere, but opportunity being in shorter supply. And these reports really underline that. And that's simply wrong. Everyone should have access to opportunity. If we are to see change in the UK, we must align, as we've heard, education outcomes with the skills required by employers and access to jobs. But we also know that the UK isn't homogenous, as, as Anne-Marie has been talking about. At the Commission, we recognise that local leaders know their areas best. And at this point, it's probably worth me sharing that we're a very diverse group of commissioners. We come from all corners of the UK with very different life experiences. And that probably explains why we're so passionate about powering up local leaders. We know that they need access to evidence so they can ask the right questions about their location. And to advance that and inform our future work, tomorrow we're hosting a joint webinar with the Local Government Information Unit and we have a larger local leaders kickoff event planned for January. We don't want to make assumptions, but to hear directly from local leaders on what evidence they need to be able to help make change where they are. Local funding is also critical. There has to be appropriate levels of funding to support the social mobility agenda in individual locations. Every year, the Commission publishes a monitoring report, and this year we published it in June. Again, it, it's on our website. You can find it there. It looks at government action by department on each of the recommendations made by the Commission over the period 2013 to 2020. I'm particularly proud of it. It's a really fascinating read. Among other things, we used it to reiterate the need for government to reconsider how local authorities are funding, making social mobility impacts explicit in the allocation of funding pots such as the town fund that Lindsay mentioned. Local authorities need much more capacity for strategic planning, longer funding periods and multi-year settlements are key to that. And of course, for us at the Commission, that sits alongside continuing to advocate for a higher level of funding to reverse the, the past budget um, cut impact that, that Lee was talking about. We don't hold any direct levers there, but, but we're, it's important. We're an important voice of government on, on those issues. But it's a fact that none of the change necessary for social mobility happens overnight. It will only be the result of consistent, determined strategic action and making sure that educational activities and the skills needed in the employment market and the employment opportunities are together. That is more important than ever. None of us need reminding that we're in very challenging time, particularly for young people. Um, the place-based inequalities highlighted in the long shadow report are, are very likely being exacerbated by the current crisis. You only have to look at yesterday's announcements about the impact being seen in education and that widening attainment gap. But look, I'm an optimist. I believe knowledge is power. And this report gives us important insights on the realities today. And my hope is we can use it to drive change. I can assure you that the commission is focused and determined to ensure, to ensure that collectively, we can make impact and build a better, more equal society for everybody. And that, that knowledge that, that, that we've got here in these reports is, is incredibly important in delivering that. Um, my thanks to the team for giving us an opportunity to shine a light on, on this important research today. And without any further ado, I'd like to hand back for Paul. I'm really looking forward to the wider discussions and getting into debate with Anne-Marie, Lee and Lindsay on, on the topics. Thank you, Paul. Well, uh, thank you very much, um, Liz. Thank you, um, Anne-Marie, Lee and Lindsay um, as well. Um, we've got a number of questions now um, on Slido, but if you, uh, if you have any more, do 
um, do let me know. Um, the uh, I'll come I'll come a little bit later to the one at the top of the list here. So just to give all the panelists a chance to think about uh, the, the the key question, which is what are the non-educational interventions that um, we should make to close the gap? But I'll come to that um, in a moment. Um, the uh, and I'm actually going to start with the um, uh, question here from Anonymous, who said that they missed the first few minutes and would like, like you, I think particularly Lindsay, to define mobility, um, because I think it's actually really quite important. It's not just a question of having missed the first few minutes. It's, um, it, it is a very important um, question. Uh, what do we actually mean by social mobility? So, so Lin Lindsay, do you want to um, take that first? But, I, but, I, but I, will, I will ask the other panellists as well, because it's not always the case that we always have the same thing in our mind when we're talking about mobility. Sure. Thanks, Paul. Um, so in the report, we, we look at two different metrics, as I said. Um, the first metric of mobility that we're thinking about is almost a measure of um, absolute mobility, if you will. So it's measuring the adult earnings of sons from disadvantaged backgrounds. So that is defined as sons who are eligible for free school meals uh, when they're at school. And, and so these are sons... Uh, adult uh, outcomes, adult earnings uh, for sons from particularly uh, disadvantaged backgrounds. So we're looking to see whether they go on to earn more um, than the circumstances of their family and childhood. Uh, the second metric that we're looking at and that we kind of talk about a lot is pay gaps. So this is a measure of relative mobility. And this is really focused on the relative gap in adult earnings between sons from advantaged families in childhood compared to sons from disadvantaged families in childhood. So the two slightly different concepts to get your head around, um, but essentially, uh, you know, different ways of looking at, at, at intergenerational mobility. And in both cases, we're really focused on this idea of your childhood circumstances and how that translates into your adult outcomes. And that's the kind of intergenerational sense of what we're looking at here. Um, and, you know, to the person who says, are we writing off over 30s? We're absolutely not writing off over 30s. It's just that the data only gets us so far at the moment, unfortunately. Um, and so we have to do what we can with what's available. But we know that these patterns um, typically widen a little bit further as individuals age. So if we looked at people who were 40 and looked at their childhood circumstances, we might see slightly larger pay gaps between sons from advantage compared to disadvantaged families. Would any of the other panellists like to just reflect on what, what, what they have in mind when they're thinking about social or intergenerational mobility, Lee? Yeah, I, I mean, I just... To back up what Lindsay's saying really, but I, do, I think you're absolutely right. We have to be clear what we mean by social mobility. So the report that's just presented has looked at both absolute, but really, really is in a sense how you are better off than your previous generation in absolute terms. Uh, but relative social mobility really means a change in the pecking order, if you like, the pecking order, whether defining income or social class. So have you moved to a different position in relative relation to your, your parents? I think there's also a wider concept of social mobility that we have to also recognise that in it, certainly in education debates, it's a broader sort of concept of your background shouldn't determine your fulfilling your 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 educational potential. It's, it's almost a sort of broader concept. But I think what I would argue is that on all those three measures, the dials are sort of pointing in the wrong direction. And the generation growing up now is unprecedented in that respect. And, and Lindsay's work and others is pointing to, to a fall in absolute mobility, but also, um, in my view, f a future uh, problems in terms of, of, of relative social mobility as well, and indeed um, uh, wider I I gaps in education. Sorry, I'm very grim, aren't I, about all this, but so. Uh... <laughs> I don't know if it's right, maybe I could come in. I, I have, a, I mean, th those are brilliant academic definitions of it. I, I always think really simply, and I just think where you start, shouldn't limit where you finish. That's what, whenever somebody says to me, what do I mean by social mobility? I, I always think that, um, but those are brilliant, much more academic, rigorous uh, definitions of it. So um, I defer to them. I suppose one of the questions that that raises is, um, you know, we, we generally think of um, what 
Lindsay and Lee referred to as relative mobility, in other words, uh, which was essentially what Liz was saying, where you start shouldn't determine where you um, finish. But in a world in which we start further apart, in other words, it, there's more inequality to start with, then presumably there's more work to be done to achieve that kind of uh, mobility. If we all started reasonably close, then it would be less difficult to move up and down. But as we start further apart, then it's more difficult. I don't know, um, I mean, again, Lindsay or Lee, to start with, whether you would like to reflect on the research evidence on, on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, Lindsay will know a lot of stuff on it. I mean, m my view is that the evidence is pretty clear on it. That if the rungs of the ladder are wider apart, it's harder to climb the ladder. Now, uh, you'll all know the de academic debates on this, whether, whether you know, there's very strong evidence linking levels of inequality across the world with uh, levels of immobility. So the UK and US have both high inequality and low social mobility or income mobility. Some would argue that's only a correlational relationship. I would argue that, that there's pretty compelling evidence that there is a causal link. And, you know, it, mobility is about as where you start and, and how you move along the road. You know, it's, it's both those things. And in my view, uh, any politician or anyone who's, who's serious about social mobility has to address inequality as well. You can't ignore it. Yeah, I think, you know, just to back up what Lisa said there, you know, the so-called Great Gatsby curve uh, paints this picture pretty clearly that inequality and immobility are kind of inextricably linked. Uh, to say it a different way, you can't have equality of opportunities without having equality of outcomes and vice versa. Um, and so, as you say, Paul, the, the rungs of the ladder getting further apart will always make this task more difficult. And anyone who thinks that we need to have a broad social justice view on life is kind of missing the point that, you know, we also need to have a view on equality of opportunities as well to get to that point, potentially. The other thing, just quickly, Paul, to add to, to, to that, uh, what I didn't mention in responding to Lindsay's, Lindsay and colleagues' study is, and I know uh, Lindsay was careful to say this isn't just about poverty and that, that, that mobility levels vary even, even for areas with similar poverty levels, but it's still the case that in Britain we have extremes. You know, there, there are parts of the UK that are the most poor areas in Europe, and we also have the richest areas in Europe. So I think, you know, by European standards, we are very unequal. Yeah, it's interesting, actually, within that, London is much the most um, unequal um, of areas of the, of the UK. But, but I think I recall, Lindsay, that it's also relatively socially mobile on your measures. That's right. That's right. London comes out pretty well in terms of the relative pay gaps. Um, it's not altogether surprising, given what we've been seeing happening in London schools for a good period of time now with regards to the high performance of particularly free school mill pupils in the capital. Yeah, it's, sli it's slightly by the by, but it is very interesting, the work on London, which, uh, you know, London is the richest part of the UK because obviously it's got uh, all the rich people, but it's got pretty much as many poor people as any other part of the, of the UK. It's, London isn't rich because there's no poverty there. London's rich because there's a lot of very rich people. Um, let, let's come on to the, um, you know, this kind of key question about what are, the non-educational interventions um, uh, that might be best for closing uh, the gap. Anne-Marie, would you like to start on that one? Yes, thanks, Paul. I think I've, I've made a case around why I think health and education are, are so vital to bring them together. Um, they act as a protective factor for each other. Um, and, and so I think uh, health interventions, particularly in the early, early years for children, are really vital. But actually, my number one thing on my wish list of a non-educational intervention would be around maternal well-being. And that would be my number one wish. When we create better starts for children through looking after their mums and helping their mums to get across becoming parents, we get much better outcomes all the way uh, through the childhood uh, trajectory. And um, some great examples of that, parents and communities together based in Southwark, You've got Baby College uh, in the Harlem Children's Zone and, and actually in Bradford, we've got Better Start Bradford. So really paying attention to uh, maternal uh, health and well-being. Liz, can I come on to you next? Yeah, I, I mean, actually, I wouldn't mind joining up with one of the other questions that I've seen come in on the Slido. I, I'd actually um, 
I'd actually talk about digital. I'd talk about the role of, of digital and access to technology in the form of both um, kit and data and skills. Um, we live in an increasingly digital world. If you look at what's happening at the moment around things like work experience for young people, as that's moved to you know, virtual means, actually there are whole segments of our society that are not able to, to partake with that. Um, what we're seeing is we've got about 17 million people in the UK that don't have what the government define as being the essential digital skills for life and work. And there's you know, about 23% of people say they've had any digital training from their employer. And yet, 80% of jobs are deemed to have digital at the core of it. So if we're talking about access to opportunities and access to jobs, then digital is a very, very real part of that. And actually at every part of life stage, because increasingly to be able to access your doctor, to be able to get access to you know, cheaper whatever, digital is at the heart of it. So that whole piece about digital to me is an incredibly part, an important part of this equation. Very interesting. Um, Lee? Yeah, I, I would add uh, something else to this. I mean, I mentioned job guarantees uh, earlier, and that, in, in a sense, that's a response to specifically the COVID crisis and the spectre of long-term unemployment. In general, I, I guess I would, I know I do a lot of work in terms of, you know, access to universities is incredibly important. Um, but actually, I think the priority in many ways should be the vocational side of the education system and all, all the international comparisons that I've seen painted in a very poor light in this respect. I, I personally think we should consider strengthening vocational routes at age 14. I know the issue has always been lack of status for this, and, and that's something you'd have to think about seriously. How do you create a, a vocational offering that is high status? And in an ideal world, and other countries do do this, by the way, I think you would link that up with training in the workplace. We're very poor in terms of reskilling training in the workplace. And we also have a very divided workplace, you know, the proliferation of the gig economy. I think we need to have, to, I know I sound very idealistic, but I, I, th I do think that we live in an unfair society. So these issues are really coming to a head and I would have minimum, not just minimum wage, I would have minimum rights for people irrespective of the type of job they do. And, and at the moment we not only have education have, have, have and have nots, we, we have probably even more stark employment uh, haves and have nots. Well, Hard to know what to add to all of those brilliant answers, but um, I think for me, there's kind of two main points here. And um, one that Amory kind of made a very good example with in, in her talk was about PwC moving offices out to Bradford. You need to get jobs out to the areas that don't have the opportunities. That's the first and in my mind, the most fundamental kind of restructure. I know we've been trying to have an industrial strategy for at least two decades, but we actually need one that works at some point. And of course, it's going to be tough. But the other point which speaks to the digital skills and the need for this is kind of this join up between recognising what employers are needing, what skills we need in the labour market, what the demand's going to be, not now, but in five years and in 10 years. And that feeding back down into the education sector and to speak to Lee's point about credible vocational qualifications, having the buy in of employers that we're teaching the kids these skills, these are the qualifications that they're getting, and these are credible and valuable and seen as that by employers who then go on to employ these kids in the labour market. It's that full process all the way through the pipeline from education into the labour market that seems to be, I mean, there are good examples in Oldham where it's starting to happen, for example, but it just seems to be missing in so many places. Well, thank you. That's a fantastic set of answers. So, um, you know, focus on the welfare of, of mothers, a focus on digital uh, skill and access, a focus on uh, vocational uh, training and training in the uh, in, in the workplace, and the uh, and the need for recognition of that and uh, flowing right through the education and work system. So, I mean, big ideas, but but not. I mean, none of those feel to me unachievable. I mean, I mean that, that's quite, I mean, that, in, in a way, I was quite positive. It wasn't sort of, you know, throw everything up in the air and start again. It was a set of what feel to me to be broadly uh, you know, manageable if big, um, if, if big things that if government really focused on, they could make some progress with. Um, the, 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 there's one question here, which is um, uh, couched um, uh, in a particular way, which um, I think really gets at... Uh, I think some people's real issues with um, social mobility, it's couched here as 
Um, some have grown rich upward mobility and can buy second homes in London and drive my children out of the market. How do I celebrate and commiserate both? Um, which I think is a, a, another way of saying, well, if there's upward mobility, um, then there's going to be losers as well. And if, um, you know, if I'm, if I'm um, reasonably comfortable and, um, and I see some people kind of moving up and above my children, um, I'm not going to be very happy. And that's presumably um, one of the biggest barriers to um, social mobility, because if they're, you know, particularly in this world where each generation is not getting much richer than the one before, um, if you move up, then someone else is going to move down and we're going to fight pretty hard to stop our own kids moving down. So, that, you, I mean, that's a kind of fairly deep philosophical point, I guess. But I mean, I, I mean Lee, you must have thought about this a lot that you've been working on um, uh, with your books uh, and so on. Is that, I mean, is, is that something that one can overcome? Is that a, is that a fundamental objection to this entire focus? On social mobilization, and if it isn't a sort of philosophical objection, is it, um, is it is it the thing that politically will stop it? Yeah, so so I've thought about this a lot, you know, and and I myself am an awkward climber. You know, I'm part of the generation who did climb, and, and I think there is something in people like me not wanting to see our children fall down, if you like, and it's the resistance to downward mobility. But and this is the big but, I think it depends what you define as success in life. And, you know, I, I meet a lot of people who say to me quite rightly that, you know, having a high powered, high paid job is not necessarily what they want to do. And so beneath the debates, are, I think are really interesting, um, you know, definitions about what we mean by success. And I think there's a real pushback I get, particularly outside places like London, where people, as I say to me, they don't necessarily want to move away from their communities. I think, as Liz was saying earlier, and actually, what they want is a decent standard of living. I'm, I'm emphasising that rather than being rich. But I think the public debate on this tends to get dominated by, and I've, and I've spoken to Lindsay about this before, and Anne-Marie, it tends to get dominated by the sort of American dream version of social mobility, which is plucking a few individuals out them becoming famous, you know, a lot of the TV shows, I'm, I'm becoming increasingly whingy as I get, old, I get older, but a lot of the, <laughs> a lot of these TV shows that you see tend to be predicated on the assumption that someone will win and all the others are losers. And I, I actually think out there, most people d reject that. And it's, and it's fine if that's what you want to do, but I think a lot of people reject that, Paul. So I, I think it, it really comes down to how you define what we mean by success in life. And that's always below these, these, these very interesting debates in social mobility. Paul, well, do, do you mind if I come in there? <laughs> I was, was going to ask you specifically, because you've obviously worked a lot on university access and so on. And there, again, there will certainly be some middle-class parents who will see this as a bit of a zero-sum game. And if you're getting um, you know, less advantaged kids into King's College, where you used to work, then their kids aren't. And uh, one sees the regular sort of um, spats in the, some of the press about, you know, the University of X, um, you know, discriminating about against, um, you know, to put it rudely, the poor little rich kids. But, um, but, 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 more, but more seriously, um, people have a sense of different competing senses of fairness, I suppose. Yeah. So, so obviously I've had, had this question a lot in my career. Um, and I always say to folks who are uncomfortable with the prospects of, of greater degrees of social mobility, why would we be so comfortable with the status quo like right now? Why are you comfortable with the idea that you're not getting the very best doctor available to you? Why are you uncomfortable with the idea that you're getting uh, not the very best lawyer available to you? Because we have such a stratified uh, ecosystem of opportunities, both educationally and in the labour market as well. Um, so so I, I think... Uh, Lee is right to say that not everyone thinks like that and certainly even people who do think do think like that have that catch where they ask themselves why why they're motivated to think in that way um, and I think we, we're um, under, underplaying the extent to which social mobility is seen as a, a common good here in the UK um, we we know that in places that are more socially mobile more socially fluid that we have greater degrees of productivity uh, we have uh, more trusting and happier societies you know these are these are things that people want uh, for our world here in the UK and social mobility is 
is one of the routes uh, uh, to getting that. And Lee is also right. I, I really, I'm really uncomfortable with this idea that folks in Bradford and folks in Doncaster and the village where I'm from are uncomfortable with the idea of social mobility. I, I just don't think that's the case. Uh, they want a decent range of opportunities for their children. And I can't help but thinking about my brother who uh, is in Lindsay's data set desperate to become an apprentice and never had the opportunity to secure that and, and really flourish uh, until he became uh, a sort of early 20s. So uh, I, I think people are hungry for social mobility. And I think this idea of, of us becoming more socially, uh, it feels like uh, society is becoming more socially sticky. It's like people's feet are becoming glued to the ground uh, in some places. And, and folks have seen that in a steady showreel over the decades. You know, Bradford, the wealthiest country at the turn of the century, uh, the wealthiest city at the turn of the century, now really struggling to create uh, wealth and opportunity within uh, the walls of the city. So um, I, I have quite a, an animated view on, on why folks should feel positive and, and celebrate some of the social mobility gains we've achieved and also the challenges we have uh, set before us as well. I, I suppose the real issue is, is, is this question of whether there is more room at the top. I mean, it, social mobility is a lot easier when there is absolute upward mobility because then everyone feels better off. And when you don't have that absolute upward mobility, then it's easy to talk about social mobility in positive terms and without the overall upward mobility, then it must mean downward mobility for some. So I guess the two are very closely linked. I guess, Liz, you must be thinking about that quite a lot as, as part of the Social Mobility Commission. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have the answer to the, I don't have the answer, I don't have a silver bullet. I mean, I, I, I love Lee's point and actually it's a question I always ask to particularly young women that I mentor, I ask them, what does success mean to them and try and challenge that view about does it just mean your, your work outcomes or, or what does it really look like? But ultimately, it's about choice, isn't it? And, and, you know, actually, you might be able to make, you know, you might be in a position, a privileged position to be able to make a choice to go and work part time or decide to do X, Y and Z. But actually, if you're Anne-Marie's brother who can't get access to an apprenticeship because he doesn't live in a place where there are access to apprenticeships, whereas my son who did want to do an apprenticeship, didn't want to go to university, was fortunate. I live on the South Coast. There's very little here in Portsmouth, despite what it might say on Lindsay's chart. But he was fortunate that his grandparents live in, in London. So he was able to, he had the choice to go and live with them for a period of time and take a London-based apprenticeship. And he had to move place to get it. So it's that thing about choice. And I, so I, to me, I, I, I always come back to, back to that and, and think there are too many people in this world that don't have choice. So I haven't answered the question very well, but I, I, I absolutely um, agree with Lee about it shouldn't be a zero sum game. And we just have to try and um, keep, keep pushing forward. So rather than come to you on that one, Lindsay, I just want to squeeze one final question in. I've got a quick fire answer to this. One of the questions that we, we've got um, what's one thing that employers should do uh, to promote uh, to promote mobility? Um, I'll come I'll, I'll come to you last to sum up here, Lindsay. But uh, let's start with um, let's start with Anne Marie this time. One thing employers should do. There's a fantastic piece of work by the Social Mobility Commission and uh, the Bridge Group, which is uh, the Employers Toolkit. It's a range of things that you can collect through your recruitment processes, data pieces and implementations uh, in your processes. That will mean that you can make better decisions uh, and spot talent to a greater degree. So uh, to implement the uh, uh, Social Mobility Toolkit from the Social Mobility Commission. Please. Yeah, I mean, that's a great report. And, it, you know, but what in one response, but I would say to add to that, you have to have diversity on your senior board and whoever that is in terms of ethnicity, gender, but also social class stroke income. And, and that, there's not enough diversity at the top still. So that, that has to be the case. Liz. I think both of those are absolutely spot on answers. The other thing I'd say at a very tactical level, I'd say more... Uh, work experience, giving young people access to be able to see the opportunities that are there and actually a lot more entry level jobs that are not necessarily predicated on having a another qualification, but are much more around your aptitude to be able to do the job. And, you know, I've worked very closely with organisations like Movement to Work that have really been pushing against that. But Amory, spot on, go and have a look at the toolkit because there are lots of things in there. And if you can sign up to that, then as an organisation, you'll be going a long way. Lindsay, oh. oops. Paul, I just wanted to add it's living wage week and it would be I would feel terrible if I didn't add that one of the key things employers can do is a credit as a living wage employer. Lindsay. 
last word. Always great to come last with these amazing people on the panel. Um, I think broadly to sum up what the, what, what's been said here is that uh, employers can look at both their access policies and their progression policies. Um, there's evidence that both access to and progression within jobs is is socially graded. You know, there's discrimination by gender and by ethnicity as well. You know, let's not forget the intersections of all of those key characteristics. And there's a lot that employers can be doing. We're working with a group of employers to look at their recruitment practices to try and help them figure out where they are penalising people from different disadvantaged backgrounds and from different kind of key groups and so I think there's a lot of work going on in this space but it's about employers getting involved and noticing that there are these problems you know the employer tool the employer index came out today um, there's a lot of great employers that you know near the top of that list who are doing really good stuff in this space and um, I'd encourage more employers to get involved and to sign up in that area. Fantastic. Well, thank you all very much. We have hit exactly um, three o'clock. Thank you for uh, keeping the time and for timing those answers so perfectly. Um, thank you all for uh, listening uh, and watching. I hope you agree that was an incredibly insightful set of uh, contributions on this topic, which um, I'm sure won't go away in our lifetime. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Liz. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Thank you, uh, 